Yeah. Um, okay, let's jump jump in right into the talk itself. So the uh, topic of my thesis is effective modeling in medical imaging with constraint data. And as Pete said, I was coming from computer vision a few years back. So back then, I was working with uh, a lot of data sets which are highly curated. I mean, they um, have well-defined tasks and the images are all clean and the availability was wide available. So um, we all enjoy, you know, this development of modeling or architectural techniques in computer vision. But when I switched to medical imaging, everything just became different. Like if you look at the papers published in those multiple years, uh, it's really, really hard to compare uh, these, uh, these works in a way that's fair enough because um, these works often use data uh, obtained from private institutions and the legal hassle of bringing these data to the public is huge. Um, not only it's hard to obtain, but annotation costs time, money that is probably not worth it to put all the, this data into the public for someone else to utilize. Um, so I think that brings a lot of challenge, unique challenge uh, in the field of medical imaging. And over the few years, I've observed a few that I'm and talking about like right now. Uh, there are actually six of them. And the first two are that recent medical images are really, really dense. Um, and by dense, I mean they're dense in terms of their resolution. Um, a modern CT could have a size of 512 by 512 by a few hundreds. And for anyone who's in the computer vision domain knows that that's going to be a huge uh, tensor to put it onto your GPU, your screen. And yet with the huge dimensionality, the information within is pretty sparse. So let's just take one of the applications, for example. Um, this, this paper uh, was a uh, work that I had worked on while I was in Google. So it tries to detect a uh, lung cancer within a CT volume. And the process of extracting the uh, lung cancer is that it detects for these lesions in the whole volume before classifying these tiny volumes into either uh, malignant or benign. And as you can also hear that the treatment um, to these very specific questions require expertise. So that, sorry, sorry next page. So these processes are very you non know, standardized as well. Uh, on top of that, the disease that's underlying all of these medical tests are extremely on tail. Let's just look at the uh, data set that I've been recently using, for example. It's a dental data set. Um, well, the most annotated object in the dental data set was actually tooth. Well, it's well, naturally tooth being the most annotated. But on the far end, we have uh, annotations like uh, objects like retention wire, uh, root, remnants are just part of a uh, teeth that's still left inside your uh, oral cavity. Like the portion of the object annotations are really um, long tail so that prediction of these rare objects require a uh, very specific treatment. And then there's other aspects of, I keep pressing on the wrong button. There's this aspect of uh, data distribution where um, acquisition, instruments and demographics for different sites can be vastly different. Still using the same data set as, as example. In the dental data set, uh, we have imaging coming from three different sites, from the Netherlands, from Brazil, and from Taiwan. And as you can clearly see with your bare eyes, uh, you don't have to even know what's in the images. The color contrasts are just different and you can see different annotations on the side of the, the images that's coming from the instrument themselves. So with all of these challenges, um, what measures have the researchers in the field of medical imaging uh, done to solve these problems? Most of them simply take existing solutions from the field of computer vision and snap this directly onto the problem of medical imaging which you know, works a lot of time 
I mean, when there's DesNet, people just use DesNet on medical imaging problems. When there's um, uh, transformer, people just take transformer and put it on medical, medical text. And that works well until you realize that, hey, we're actually dealing with medical imaging. And if you ignore the underlying medical uh, expertise and uh, knowledge underlying, then you will be missing out on a lot of the opportunities. So let's take a prior work that I'm not going to cover uh, <laughs> later, for example, but bear with me here. So uh, this is a report generation task that's supposed to, that is supposed to take a X-ray and write a report on top of the X-ray image uh, to mimic the process of uh, radiologists when they're in the dark room. And uh, on the orange and the red bars are the models that are aware of the underlying clinical assumptions and aware of the uh, outputs being clinically reasonable. And across the board, it's just better in terms of nat natural language metrics and clinical metrics uh, than the models labeled in blue or green, which does not consider these uh, clinical implications at all. So this is just one of the uh, examples to show you, hey, medical problems do require medical solutions. Right, following these thoughts, uh, I have presented in the thesis um, multiple possible solutions to uh, medical imaging in a constrained setting. But I'm not going to cover all of them in this talk, obviously, because uh, for the sake of time. So what I will cover is the three topics uh, that I've chosen that is worth covering in a short session. Uh, the first being transfer learning for cancer mortality assessment. Second being reinforcement learning on top of weekly supervised data. And the third being federated learning. All right, let's jump into it. So the first task that we're looking at is uh, transfer learning for cancer mortality assessment. In this work, we're going to look at a, a, a concept called surrogate modeling endpoints. And we're going to also look at transfer learning. And to predict to, or to assess the mortality um, uh, risk factor for cancer, we're going to use the thing called body composition. I mean, you know body composition, you know, you step on a machine holding your hands on a metal rod, it just run currents through your body to get measurements of how much fat, how much water, how much muscle is in your body. Well, that's good, but until you realize that it's just a machine trying to measure your impedance at a different uh, frequency range. But if we're able to you know, use 3D imaging to look at your body, then we can you know, specifically uh, draw out areas where uh, there's muscle, there's fat, and, um, and provide an accurate measure of these compositions. Well, easier said than done. Um, 3D imaging is actually pretty complicated and working out the exact uh, voxel by voxel annotation is hard. So uh, researchers along this line have been using something called a circuit endpoint in 2D and they extract a specific slice out of the CT image. While concretely the uh, top, at the top of the L3 vertebral body and that slice uh, when they look at the uh, distributions of the muscle fat, uh, it's a really, really good approximation of your whole body uh, body composition. So they've reduced this problem from 3D to uh, a 2D proxy. And that's the main uh, theory behind why we're able to deliver this work on fully automated body composition assessment. Sorry, question? Sorry. Please. How is the body composition related to the cancer assessment? The mortality in cancer, like how, how are these related to each other? Oh yeah, uh, so Dina just asked uh, how the uh, body composition is related to the cancer uh, assessment. And that's actually the part that I'm getting in right now. We have, <laughs> we have three uh, different stages in quantifying um, the risk for cancer. Uh, we, are, we are actually using a uh, local pancreatic cancer registry as uh, the patient cohort. We first will try to localize the desired slice uh, or tissue quantification. Then on top of the slice, 
we will quantify the different amount of tissue in that slice. Now we have the uh, amount of tissues. These would actually, um, we can correlate the tissue amount to the survival for these patients in the long run. So, you know, according to the different uh, percentage of their uh, body composition, uh, we know exactly what the risk factor was for the patients. So the composition are used in a survival analysis for the pancreatic, uh, pancreatic cancer patients in this way. So, so there is, there is a question of how accurate uh, is, like even if you get the composition perfectly, how did that translate into cancer mortality? Yeah. And then there is a question of how accurate you can get the, this uh, description. The, uh, Absolutely. Okay. And yeah. And you're still going to tell us where the transfer learning fit in the bigger picture. Yeah, and that's a lot. <laughs> so. So uh, on, on top of the three different stages, I will provide evaluations on each of the stages. And uh, also in the middle, we will see where transfer learning comes into play, where, um, because typically uh, in this tiny data set uh, as a local registry, uh, you don't really have a lot of imaging data. So our idea is that uh, on top of using your, only your local data, you want to use the public, uh, publicly available data as a training set. And we want to investigate how um, the distribution shift uh, is impacting the prediction uh, accuracy for the uh, model train on this external data and how you could uh, make that error a lot less. So uh, before we, we jump into like the actual data or uh, results, I'll show you like what um, specific things we have done comparing uh, similar works in the field. So a lot of the, the works in the field are focusing on only quantifying the different tissues, including muscle, subcutaneous fats, and um, uh, visceral fats. And well, visceral fats is just a fancy way of saying uh, the organ fat, and the subcutaneous fat is the uh, fat right below your skin. So they've been very focused on only quantifying these numbers while we are also involving uh, slice selection, um, including the ex external test set to validate that the model applies and generalized to different set of data. And further, we're using th these numbers to correspond to diseases that actually happen in the hospital. So we've been talking about data, right? We said we want to use the external data and uh, internal data. This actually, the, the pancreatic cancer registry was actually collected in a hospital in Boston where there are a uh, hundred something patients and we annotated the body composition or the segmentation for 40 of the patients. And for the external data, we're using a very well-known data set called uh, liver tumor segmentation challenge data set. Um, well, it's what it was used for liver tumor segmentation, but uh, it, it, it the CT images were clear enough that it covers the part of the uh, L3 vertebral body that we want. So we also penalty those. So uh, we're playing around with the, these two data sets. How big is the other data set? Uh, the external data sets is 200 patients with 40 patients annotated. Or well, they were uh, doing the liver tumor segmentation, so they did not have any composition annotated. So both the internal and external were annotated uh, uh, in the study. So we did three different uh, set of experiments on the two first, the, the first two stages about slice selection and tissue quantification. Um, we tried, you know, training on external, test on external, train on external, test on internal, which is actually the most, uh, most likely use case because you know, if you're just a very tiny institution, you will want to use the uh, publicly available data to train and then test it on your local data. Well, we're going to show that that's not the best. You could, you could easily do better by augmenting the external data with some internal data. So that's what we, uh, we're doing in the third uh, experiment where we use both the external data and internal data as training and test it on local. So these are the scenarios that we're comparing. 
Um, I mean, this is, a, this is a result that looks very complicated, but let me try to uh, walk you through. On the left panel, it's the slice selection where we try to um, locate the exact slice at the top of the L3 vertebral body. And we have the choice of you know, uh, nominating multiple slices so that the more slices that we try to uh, nominate, the uh, closer um, to the actual slice that one of these slices gets. Um, and on the right, we correlate the segmentation outputs with the ground truth. And let me annotate some, oh, I probably messed up the legion on the right side. This is the right region. So please follow this one instead of the uh, one in the last page. But anyways, uh, what I want to show in general is that when doing slice selection, you don't always get to predict the right slice. You, you know, you might be predicting the slice at the top of the L4 vertebral body or, or L5. So um, these uh, predictions have errors, but in general, uh, having three slices is already good enough. And then, it's pretty natural to see uh, by adding local data into the training data, it helps tremendously in terms of slice selection error. And on the right side of tissue quantification, remember we're characterizing muscle, subcutaneous fat, and visceral fat, calculating their uh, error in terms of uh, area and how they correlate with the ground truth. And it turns out by adding just a reasonable amount of training data uh, from your local registry, it helps a lot uh, with the learning process. And it actually, if you look at the uh, intra-class correlation coefficient, you're able to boost it up to a extent where, uh, where it's, it's close to training with external and testing with, with external. Um, now we have these numbers. Uh, we can use the quantification of tissue in a survival analysis. So, uh, how, what is exactly the output of your model? Like, what, is it like for it just percentage for muscles, percentage of fat? Percentage? Oh, got but it. What is uh, so the input is the, the it's a slice, correct? Input is the whole volume where I extract a slice, a tensor. a tensor, and then uh, becomes a slice. Mm -hmm. And then uh, at the output, you will have the area for the uh, different tissues. So, so you do a segmentation? Segmentation, okay. right. And okay. counting the uh, uh, pixels. OK. And then the other question is, are these, do these have equal amount of input data? Like when you say, uh, in, uh, lits to local versus lits plus local to local. Is it like, I don't know, like in the training, there are 200 samples uh, in both cases, or actually when you add the locals, you, it becomes 220. Oh. Like basically, is the benefit is because you are adding the local information, or also it has more training examples? Oh, so uh, when we add local data to the list training, we actually uh, do not remove the original training data. So that it's actually, there are actually more training data. So maybe a better uh, experiment, experimental design following this should be that we sort of like uh, have a mix between the external training and internal training to see uh, if it's actually the internal training that's helping instead of the uh, training sample count. Yeah. And, and the training side, like these data sets are pretty small, 200. I'm really surprised that it works with such a very small number. I'm also very surprised. Like, <laughs> it is, so in most of the uh, uh, medical imaging experiments, I'm pretty surprised by the fact that we're able to train an effective model uh, when we only have tens of images or hundreds of images in the classification task. Are you going to say anything about your model? Um... Okay, so uh, the model is actually nothing uh, too surprising. It's actually just uh, most of the models I'm using here are ResNet based models. I didn't intend to add anything fancy about it because the uh, 
the essence of these works are to show that some specific techniques are helpful in terms of making these models better in, instead of you know, trying to be the best in the world, having the highest accuracy. So uh, I'm using like very simple ResNet based models. And for segmentation, uh, it's mostly like uh, 18 layers in a down sample uh, path and another few layers uh, on, on the up sample, um, up sample path. Okay. Yeah, nothing too fancy. I like in computer vision where we're just crunching the numbers, trying to do the best one in the world, being on the top of the leaderboard. Okay. Uh, remember we had numbers, like three numbers concretely for each of the patients uh, on the end of the uh, tissue quantification. So we are now performing some survival analysis based on their body composition compared to uh, the survival in uh, during the course of pancreatic cancer. We compare two things. Um, one is the muscle, muscle quantity, and the other is the visceral fat quantity. And there is a well-known condition called sarcopenia, which is loss of muscle at uh, a older age. And there's a, a pretty concrete definition of that in terms of numbers. Um, if we plot the, this is called like kaplan mayer curve, where on the axis, it just shows the survival rate. Oh, sorry. On the y-axis, it shows the survival rate. On the x, it's just the um, how much time has passed since the uh, disease. So uh, as we can see here, the loss of muscle has a lot of impact on the survival rates of these pancreatic cancer patients, while visceral fat does not. Harry, is, is the age distribution of the sarcopenia and no sarcopenia patients the same or, or, or is it different? So I'm, I'm just worried about confounding by age differences. Uh, I, I have to go back to the paper to actually check this, but um, I don't think I have the answer on top of my head. Yeah, sure. but we, we have like an analysis between two different cohorts uh, in the table. Uh, with some p-value, but I don't remember specific. I don't remember specifically uh, whether the p-value was significant enough yeah. or not. Harry, Harry, you might recall that this is a very homogeneous pancreatic cancer cohort that has a very narrow age difference, and so the sarcopenia you're talking about here is a little bit different from the sarcopenia in old people, but something we also now in oncology as a measure which we like to explore better and haven't been able to do this before we introduced computer vision. So I think the answer to Pete's question is it's a very narrow pancreatic cancer cohort, though there is no age confounding in there. Right, thank you, Alex. Uh, that's basically just answered that question. Yeah, so it's uh, the spectrum of the age is pretty limited. So uh, maybe we have to go back to the numbers, but the two groups should not have too much uh, discrimination in terms of the age distribution. So like uh, for, for this work, I think the best way to put this application to use is, you know, have the system in the background uh, as a form of ambient AI so that it monitors the incoming uh, imaging um, as patients get scanned. So we're able to provide some alerts uh, to the hospital when we detect something like muscle loss uh, in the process. Um, well, you know, we're leveraging the body composition concept, which is a lot more descriptive uh, than measurements like BMI. Well, that's, with that said, this approach does have limitations because we're using, if you still remember, three stage approach, and any uh, error uh, produced on earlier stages would accumulate until the end. So maybe there is, there could be a modeling technique where we use end to end prediction. And um, this method can actually be expanded to 3D uh, uh, body composition assessment because while human annotating 3D is really slow, machines don't care about that. They, they just are able to annotate 3D body composition pretty blatant fast. Okay, so this uh, is the first work that I'm introducing to you. Uh, now we hop into the uh, second work. Uh, reinforcement learning with uh, weekly supervised dental imaging data. In this work, I will introduce two 
key concepts, which is using clinical knowledge to uh, infuse in your modeling process. And the second is how uh, computationally the knowledge could be infused. Well, it's reinforcement, reinforcement learning. The task we're looking at is uh, dental x-ray finding summarization. As you might have seen before this image uh, in the beginning of the talk, it's called orthopentomogram. And we want to summarize the findings that we can see in this OPG image into a table of findings describing what the uh, 32 teeth look like and what's, uh, the, what's the thing in the teeth um, in all of them. And in terms of supervision, what kind of training data do we have on top of the image? Uh, oftentimes we have pixel-wise supervision in the form of like segmentation or uh, detection annotation. And in this work, we also want to try whether we're able to add another new modality of supervision, which we call weak supervision. It's nothing fancy except uh, the dentist now only have to label 32 binary labels, whether the, the teeth are present. So, you know, uh, in terms of dent supervision, the dentists actually have to sit in front of the computer, you know, making dots uh, for up to 30 minutes to annotate a full image. But for a weak supervision, uh, the, uh, they only have to check several check boxes to see uh, which of the 32 teeth are present. And that is a lot faster than the per pixel annotation. And we want to leverage that. And on the right, it's an example of that. You know, just check uh, how many teeth are present. Um, you, you might have received multiple you know, OPG scannings in the past. Um, it's a machine where there's something for you to bite at the center. And uh, once the machine started, the, the scanner will uh, rotate in a half circular uh, manner to scan your oral region. But, it, but instead of producing a 3D representation, it produces this 2D circular compressed representation of your oral region. Um, it's pretty fast. It, it could be acquired in under 10 seconds. So it's frequently used as a first line screening tool. However, you know, due to its uh, uh, overlaying 2D, because of, of its nature that it compresses everything into a 2D uh, image, uh, oftentimes the um, different objects are overlaid on top of each other. So uh, it has its pros and cons. In this work, we're actually trying to explore a lot of things, as I always seem to do. Um, prior work that tries to process, process these OPGs they look at several aspects. Um, there are people who look at implant de detection. There are people who detect the tooth. And you know, some people just detect the tooth run without numbering them, uh, but some people do. And what fascinates me is that nobody seems to consider the simple fact that uh, normal humans have, to up, have up to 32 teeth and 32 teeth only in their mouth. So a lot of them are producing uh, nonsense predictions, or they're, they're simply not considering this simple fact. So we are planning to use this simple fact and add what we call weak supervision in the, the modeling process. This is roughly how the system looks like. I mean, it's all colorful. I like these colorful images. Um, in this work that were published in Nikai last year, we tried to uh, pr propose a new data set on the task of OPG finding summarization. And we propose this novel system that tries to capture six different findings for the 32 teeth with a pretty reasonable accuracy. Well, mostly we want to show that this new type of annotation is useful. So there, there are uh, many different components in this network. Uh, let me scroll, scroll to the next page for a better demonstration. There, uh, this functional segmentation module, which looks at the image and say, hey, this is the background, this is the teeth, this is impacted teeth, and this is restoration. It doesn't care about the identity of the teeth. And on the lower part, we have the uh, object or tooth localization module. 
it cares about the identity of the chief further than the functionality. And if we're able to combine the both, we're able to show uh, in each of the two, what are the functionalities. So uh, the colorful image on the right is a combination of the two strings of information that ultimately leads to the finding summary table. But what's the secret sauce here? Uh, I, I mentioned that we have a secret sauce that tries to utilize the uh, uh, weak supervision data. Before jumping into that, I want to tell you how we just consider the fact that there's 32 T. It's pretty simple. Um, don't get the equation. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> putting the equa equation out here to intimidate you. Um, but simply put, for anyone who has done like uh, object detection, you know that the end of the object detection model, it predicts a lot of objects, maybe up to 200. But we don't have 200 teeth in our model. So among the 200 objects, there must be some objects that are at the actual teeth. So in this part of the whole pipeline, we try to find a corresponding matrix or a assignment matrix that maps some of these 200 to the 32. Uh, with a binary assignment. So E matrix here is a binary matrix. And we want to maximize the total likelihood of the assignment minus the overlapping between objects. Be because like a single object, I don't want it to be classified as the uh, molar teeth and the KNIT at the same time, right? They, they shouldn't overlap. So it becomes this formulation down below where you see a very interesting pattern. Um, it's actually a optimization that you can do at inference time to you know, make a better guess of what objects are actually the resulting 32 T. It's called like general, generalized quadratic, quadratic assignment problem that are very, very well studied before. And the reason why we're formulating the uh, uh, assignment this way is that there are solvers available uh, online that I don't have to look into. They just give me the optimal uh, assignment. So uh, in this page, we consider the fact that there are only 32 T, but where does the weak, uh, weak supervision comes in? So, I mean, again, more equations that you probably can ignore, but listen to me. Now that we have some dentists trying to annotate what teeth are actually in your mouth. So we want the assignment to reflect the annotation as much as possible. If it doesn't reflect, I'll penalize you. That's the idea. And I'm using that reward uh, as the reward function in the reinforcement learning, telling, hey, this dentist is giving you the signal that some teeth are present. And if you don't predict the correct uh, arrangement, you're going to be penalized. That's it. We uh, optimize this function in uh, with reinforcement learning in the training time. Why is this problem a suitable for reinforcement learning as opposed to any other supervised method? Oh, um, so the reason why uh, this is especially suitable for reinforcement learning because these objectives are non-differentiable, especially the part where it gets where the decoding happens. Um, because so a lot, so uh, reinforcement learning typically applies when uh, the uh, the target that you're training for is not uh, uh, different differentiable, and it just offers you a way to provide learning signal to the. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think I understand exactly the problem, but it seems that it is just a segmentation problem, which on top of which. You added a the quadratic assignment, right? But a segmentation problem from images is a very natural problem to do using supervised learning, not using reinforcement learning. Reinforcement oh. learning typically, when there is a policy, and also reinforcement learning typically requires a humongous amount of data, which I doubt that you have. Oh, uh, so you are saying that uh, typically we just provide better segmentation data, so it learns better. 
And I think in, in, in medical imaging, it's, it's, it's just typically is the case that annotation comes at a uh, much more expensive price, both uh, in terms of time and in terms of uh, money. So we, we simply want to try if we're able to use it faster to annotate uh, uh, modality of annotation to provide learning signal. And if we're able to prove that with this faster to annotate uh, uh, label, we're still able to increase the accuracy um, of the detections, then the, the, this new modality will have its own unique value, specifically in the field of so medical So the imaging. annotation in your case is different from the segmentation? Like what is exactly the annotation? Oh, the, the uh, annotation that we are providing, uh, 32, zero or ones, denoting whether the teeth are present. So instead of having to sit down, drawing circles, dentists only have to check 32 boxes. Okay, so it is a high level information about the-, the Extremely high level X -ray information. X-ray saying, uh, basically it's your output, I mean, or the, the prediction is a vector of 32, a binary vector of 32 elements. Is that correct? And that way you want to predict as well? Um, the, yeah, the annotation is a, will correspond to the output in some manner, but not in a one-to-one -one manner, but uh, through a assignment matrix that requires some optimization. Yeah, take your model as a whole with all of the optimization and all of that stuff. This input is an X-ray of the, of the job. Right. And input is the output is a, uh, a binary vector is uh, 32 elements, is uh, that correct? The, the output is uh, whether it's like a set of labels for the 32 teeth, including the six type of findings and whether they exist at all, plus dental implants, which uh, is their own category. Okay, so it's for each of the teeth and there is a binary, so it's, so the output is a vector still, so of 32 elements. Mm -hmm. I guess it's not a vector, it's maybe a matrix. If like on one side is 32 elements, one for yeah, example, more like a matrix. Right? Yeah. And then a vector for each, for each tooth that has zero one, which is presence. And what are the other? Yeah, it's more like a matrix where uh, it's 32 on one side, uh, denoting the 32 teeth and six or seven on the other side, uh, indicating the findings that we find in those teeth. Okay. Yep. And plus implants, <laughs> because we detect implants uh, in a different way. Okay. No. I have a follow-up question, sorry. Um, is, that, is the final finding that you actually show in the previous slides, right? Is that just like the final finding should uh, okay, so one. yeah, that... so uh, the yeah, uh, depending on who you are, you will try to view the summary table differently. So, for dentists, uh, actually, like they love to see this view of the table better because, uh, yeah, they want to see uh, different findings as different roles and how many teeth are having those type of findings. But it's essentially the same as uh, a matrix. Like yeah, so basically ones. the output would be the finding map and also the summary table, is that the case? Yeah, um, I would say summary table is going to be the major oh. output and finding map is just a auxiliary output that could be helpful, but it's not the uh, most important output. Thank you. Well, but in, in, in Dina's um, question, the summary table is really computed from that other dimension of the of the thirty two tooth vector, so for each tooth, you you have uh, an indication of whether it's missing or impacted or has a crown and bridge or has restorations or dot dot dot, right? And right. then the summary table is just how many of those occur. So the, so I I actually don't think the summary table is bringing any new information. It may be the right way to present the data to a dentist, 
but the information is really in that two-dimensional matrix output. P, you're right. So uh, the way the summary table is produced is by looking at this finding map. And basically for each of the objects, it'll have a certain fraction of uh, an area of being. Um, so if you look at the, these teeth here, it will be colored in different, uh, in different colors like blue, red, or green. And depending on how big those areas are, uh, it will be labeled as, there, there's gonna be a threshold for each of the finding types. Once the finding uh, in terms of area exceeds a specific percentage, it will be labeled as that type. So it's like a, a reduced representation of the finding map. Yeah. Uh, convenient, with, but with probably less uh, information. Okay. And in terms of your reinforcement learning, like what is the what's the cost function? What is what did you define as state? What did you find define as actions? Like what like you are not. Can, are you going to say something about the model itself? Uh, okay, I, I actually don't plan to go into the specifics, uh, but in general, for the reinforcement learning, we're using. I know about yeah, general the, <laughs> the, <laughs> We're using policy gradients, uh, uh, basically uh, the uh, good old like reinforced algorithm, where uh, the reward uh, is calculated, and then. But um, what is your what is like you, everyone defines a reward that fit there particular problem to find this like, state and action and all of that stuff. So that they fit the standard uh, oh, reinforcement framework, the, the but definition of specific state. problem yeah, state so and that action. can be understood with and the, the, the specific problem that they have. Got it. Well, uh, to put it simply, uh, if we look at the equation here, so I skipped over a step where we sample the, from the uh, assignment metrics here. Um, when we're actually doing the reinforcement learning, instead of like uh, decoding with this uh, GQAP problem with the solver every time, we actually sample from uh, a distribution um, because uh, for reinforcement for reinforcement learning to work, you have to input the exploration to a problem space. So I would say this assignment, this statistic uh, assignment metrics here is the state, and the uh, uh, sampling would be the action uh, that corresponds to the typical reinforcement learning problem. It's not defined very accurately, but uh, that's the relationship. Go ahead. Okay, um, let's take a very quick look at the data that we're using. Um, in the original data set, they have their own annotation of identities. And we're not just using the identities, the, the localizations of these objects. We're also uh, labeling the functionalities of each of the voxels. Also, we provide a weak summary in the form of uh, 32 binary labels. Also, as the uh, final test results, we are providing 47 final summaries for 47 images. So these are all the uh, extra data that we annotated on top of this already existing public data sets. Um, I want to first show you how well the, how, how good the model is. Well, but we're not going to dive into detail. This is uh, uh, the usual sensitivity versus specificity plot that you all see. So the more the curve is to the top left, the better the algorithms are. And if you look at the uh, area on the curve for all of these uh, uh, plots, all of these findings, you can see it's more or less at least at the range of 80 to 90%. So it's effective to some extent. Uh, but, but like this plot alone doesn't really say a lot of things, right? You have to compare with uh, uh, existing work. So that's what we do. We choose a uh, operating point for all of these findings uh, with the highest endpoint score. And we try to compare it with prior works. So I'm gonna skip to the next stage, uh, which is the comparison to prior works. As I told you in the opening slides, comparison is extremely hard because they're using their own private data, their own weird ways of uh, evaluating the uh, detection and segmentation. But we managed to crack 
their exact formula and use their formula to compare. So we're not comparing apples to apples, but at least we're comparing pineapples to apples here, okay? So the red is uh, our algorithm in this work. And uh, comparing on two segmentation, we're able to more or less outperform previous works. While in you know, precision, we're, we're lacking a bit on precision, but since we choose a fairly balanced operating point, the F1 still wins over the previous works. And over the work that focuses on implant and natural truth detection, we show that uh, the system is better overall. Um, on top of the comparison to prior works, remember I said that we involved the extra modality of uh, weak supervision. Let me take a look. Uh, let, let us take a look at the, how this extra modality works. On the top row, uh, the row with a lot of uh, rect uh, rectangles, it's the uh, system with these weak, weak supervision. It only costs a hundred percent of annotation time. Um, because as I said, the dentist has to take up to 30 minutes for a single study for the dense annotation, but annotating this extra uh, uh, weak supervision it only, only takes 1% of time. And with this tiny bit of extra information, it's actually able to improve the overall average of uh, summarization AUC score with the exception of prion bridge and implants. This is pretty interesting because the extra information we're providing are on the identity of the teeth, but crown and bridge over, uh, it usually spans over multiple teeth. And implants, it's not even considered uh, in the 32 teeth. So the extra information we're providing are not about these specific objects. So, I mean, there's a pretty natural correspondence uh, or explanation why the AUC score dropped for these classes. But overall, it still uh, gives a pretty, um, it still gives a performance boost. So uh, I think this work still, still deserves some more further verification because uh, I think mm, we do want to provide data from multiple inst clinical institutions and uh, the annotation quantity is not enough to fully prove that this technique would work in a larger scale. So uh, I do want to follow, have some follow-up work to uh, this technique. And an interesting thought is that the predictions that we're trying to yield here are very uh, diagnostic oriented, but the field of dentistry itself is very intervention oriented. Like they, they, they don't really care about what the uh, imaging itself really looks like. They just care about uh, treating the patients and making sure they left the, they leave the clinic with a, with a smile on, on their face. So maybe for the dentistry uh, AI in general, maybe we have to consider intervention as endpoints. That's an open question. Right, let me take a, a, a very quick stab at my third work. Uh, fabricated learning for uh, data collaboration. So uh, why is, so for those who have not heard of federated learning, let me uh, do a very quick introduction uh, to you all. So in typical learning, we all you know, steal the data from all the parties into a centralized database and then do the trading there, which is you know, the modality that we're all uh, uh, very familiar with. But for federated learning, uh, these participating parties or medical institutions, they do not want to leak their local private precious data. So they participate in federated learning in a way that it does not directly hand their local data to uh, the server. Instead, it trains the model uh, locally for a few steps before uploading the learning signal. And the server will try to find an average or consolidate the uh, learning signal and then send the consolidated model back to these clients. So what leaves this, uh, the client is the learning signal, not the data itself. 
Um, it's actually a learning paradigm that had existed for decades, but Google sort of like reinvented this uh, concept in 2017, um, enabling this paradigm to work in a deep learning setup. With that said, there's a lot of challenges, uh, mainly two challenges that I have observed in here. The first one is distribution difference that these different clients, they can hold very different distributions, um, maybe uh, due to demographic difference, maybe due to uh, imaging acquisition difference, as, as I was just saying. And second of all, the uh, data set sizes could vary drastically, which is called imbalances. So there is a need to try to benchmark how these uh, challenging aspects who can improve Sorry, can impact federated learning algorithms. But the question I encountered uh, back then was that there was even no uh, large scale natural imaging uh, studies on this aspect. So before I wanted to do medical imaging uh, benchmarking, I had to resort to natural image as a precursor. So specifically in the work that I uh, accomplished in Google uh, two years ago, uh, I try to use natural imaging data sets, uh, put it into a federative learning scenario and tune a knob which determines the level of no identicalness between the federative learning clients and see how bad the uh, existing algorithms could be impacted. You know, we try to make the, the, the federative learning set up more challenging and try to break the existing algorithms. That's the main push uh, behind this work. And uh, for the sake of time, we're not going to cover the aspect of imbalance here. We're only going to cover the identicalness. What, how do you calculate uh, no identicalness or how do you define it concretely? Um, for these different, different parties that are participating in federated learning, uh, they, aggregate, they, they aggregate, uh, if you look at the uh, colors in a circle, they have very different distribution compared to a global distribution, which is calculated uh, by taking the mean of them. And if you calculate the distribution difference between A and the global distribution, and B versus the global distribution, and C versus the distri global distribution, uh, and you average them, that's the metric that describes how different these different clients are. Uh, and that's also an indicator of how challenging if you pull all of these federated clients into uh, a learning scenario. To conduct the experiments, uh, we proposed two sets of data sets, uh, one more synthetic on the left and one a larger, a large scale natural imaging data set that you can find in the wild. So iNaturalist is pretty interesting. Uh, it's a, a data set that CT scientists gather and upload to the cloud. They basically, they basically go out to the wild, take some uh, photos of species, and then upload to the registry, providing the corresponding labels. So there are a lot of participating CT scientists and also a lot of species classes. On top of that, more importantly, there are a lot of images. And remember, what we wanted to do is to provide a real world setup to see how this cruel world can break federated learning. Right. Um, now I'm going to show you the uh, pretty much the final result that you will see today. Uh, I know this is a complicated chart, so let me decipher it for you. Uh, this is the effect of no identicalness could impact uh, could have on a federated learning setup. On the X axis. It's the no identicalness measure that I just mentioned, the earth movers distance going from zero to two. So if we have a, a, a data set of an EMD of two, wow, that's really, really no identical. Like all of the clients are having different distributions. But if the point is more on the left, that means uh, these clients, they're holding pretty much the same uh, data. So more to the right, more challenging, more to the left, uh, easier data sets. Also, if you look at the bottom panel, uh, along the y-axis, 
there is this relative accuracy which states if you steal somehow, you know, if you're, you're a pretty good thief that steals all the data and store it on a centralized server and train it with a centralized learning algorithm, what's the maximum uh, accuracy you can get in terms of classifying the classes? In this case, it's 86%, but federated learning is not going to break that limit. That's the stealing. So we're normalizing the uh, performance by that stealing to be 100%. Oh, I mean, this is like this is Cypher 10 this classification. Is, this is Cypher 10. On, on a central server, is 86% the accuracy? Uh, with a fairly limited model. Uh, yeah, uh, the, so the classification of Cypher 10 on a fairly limited model uh, is the accuracy is 86%. And the reason for that is because we specifically choose a uh, uh, very small model that fits into the mobile. Why? Why? I mean, of course, time for 10, like if we use proper model, I mean, it's in the upper 90s. Yeah. Yeah. So, but why did you choose like a very limited model? Uh, uh, because of, this is highly limited. Right. It's extremely it's high, highly limited. Like yeah. I said, of the R sec are probably approaching 100% already. But, but why for this problem use such a model that is not what you would typically use? Even for small data set like Cypher 10. Yeah, I remember the data was actually uh, Lynet, which is one of the first neural networks out there. And the reason we choose similar uh, model is because uh, not only we want to show that uh, basically we're not going for the state of the art models and that we want to make sure that these models actually works on mobile devices because the intended use cases on the mobile devices to train uh, these models. And we're providing like some of the simplest model available. So this only applies to uh, Cypher 10 and 100. And for iNaturalist, we're actually using mobile net, which is a more practical scenario. So this is more like a toy data set if you, if you think about it that way. Yeah, but I'm trying to think whether some if the results would generalize if the model was more sophisticated. Got it. Uh, I, I totally understand it. So maybe uh, a better way of doing this experiment will be also including some modern uh, uh, models that performs generally better. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we choose to normalize the accuracies so that you know it's always a ceiling. The the centralized learning accuracy always. Uh, stays at 100 relatively. So we don't have to worry about the specific uh, models that we're using at the moment. Right. And the, the trend I want to show is that the, more, the harder the problem is, uh, in general, uh, the more impact it has on classic federated learning problems. So uh, the more to the right, the lower the uh, accuracies are in general. A very, very interesting thing is that on the green column I'm drawing out here, it's actually a scenario where one of the clients is holding just one class of the image. That means, you know, I'm holding all the cat image and you're holding all the dog image. And collaboratively in federated learning, we're able to train a useful data classifier. That's pretty interesting. I mean, I've never seen dog images and you've never seen cat images still models are able to be trained in that way. And, uh, well, maybe you don't have to notice, notice so, uh, it. Are you trying to make a point between the blue and the red? Like, what is what is the, the point that you are trying to make? Are you just trying to make the point that if the Earth's mover distance is larger, then the performance goes lower? Or are you trying to also make a point about some proposed improvement that is like the, that is shown in the color. Right, the most important point to make here is uh, we have a metric that describes how hard the problems are. And with that metric being larger, the overall performance become worse. And as you can see later in other experiments, we are showing that this, the trends are similar. What is M for? Uh, so, average M? yeah. This is actually a pretty naive fix to the problem by adding momentum to the server, which at the time, somehow miraculously, nobody did. But adding momentum on the server already fixed a good portion of the problem. But it still does not uh, deviate from the fact that 
the more to the right, the harder the problem is, the lower the accuracies are in general. And what I want to show you is that not only Sidebar 10 shows this trend, Sidebar 100 shows this, wrong uh, button again, but Sidebar 100 shows the same trend despite being a harder problem. See, we have x axis being a descriptive uh, metric showing how hard the problem is, how no, identical the clients are. And for iNaturalist, which is a real world data set, it shows uh, very, very similar trends. And I think the comparison of these three curves are the uh, takeaway message for uh, this work. That we have a descriptive metric of the you know, identicalness of our data set. And the harder it is, the lower the uh, accuracy gets. And if we're able to you know, further unify these curves on the same plot, then we can extend this conclusion hopefully to the field of medical imaging when it comes to classification. And that's why uh, I'm, I'm uh, doing this pedagogy learning uh, research on top of natural imaging, because I think it's a precursor to medical imaging tasks. Harry, is there some, some magic about an earth mover distance of about 1.7? I, I don't have a good intuition for what the scale of Earth mover distances should be. Oh, the, uh, the maximum, if, I, if I'm if i holding all cat images and if you're holding all dog images, yeah. then the EMD between us is two. Okay, uh, but I see, all right. But why is this the right way? I mean, basically you are describing the difference between two distributions. There are many different ways of describing and, and more natural than the Earth mover like the KL convergence, for example. Uh, yeah, we actually tried KL convergence in the work, but ultimately a KL convergence, a KL divergence depends on the number of classes. So EAD is actually a more universal way to describe the uh, dis discrepancy um, without being affected by the number of classes. Yeah, it's just happened to be one magical uh, concept that we're able to pin down for all of these different data sets that pretty much aligns them in the same grid. Getting nervous about the clock. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, right, maybe let me wrap up this uh, presentation by pointing out a few interesting directions that I'm working on, or I think people should be working on. Uh, the first thing is, uh, since you know people are looking at transformer models in NLP, and I, I, I haven't seen a, a lot of works that tries to work on having a learning framework that brings in multiple tasks in medical imaging. And the second direction is, uh, people are using ImageNet still to pre-train as a preacher model for their medical imaging model. Now, this is just weird. So uh, I've been thinking that we could actually pull together a big set of uh, medical images and use them in a contrastive learning way so that you know, we're able to have a model that understands the distribution of medical imaging well enough without getting into a specific uh, uh, medical task. And the third, which is probably the most interesting, is um, I mean, I, I, along the years I've been studying medical imaging, I've seen a lot of uh, chest x ray. And I know, you know what a fracture looks like, what an intubation looks like, and whether there's a pacemaker or not. But it's not these findings that are the most important to clinicians because they could see it directly with their bare eyes. What they need is the things that they rarely find uh, in their glimpse on the image. Uh, it's the difference between the things they'll find in the first second and the first minute that matters the most. So maybe the prediction uh, that fills this gap would be a lot more important in the future for medical imaging and maybe for uh, medical machine learning in general. Okay, so that's uh, the thought of providing today. Um, 
this work would not have been possible without the thesis committee, the co-authors, uh, in MIT, outside MIT, also all the funding sources, and anyone who's attending this uh, thesis defense in person. Also, I have to mention uh, my wife, who's also present here, uh, Chelsea, uh, who happens to be one of the co-author in one of the papers. She's a dentist, so we actually work on a few, quite a few dental papers together. Uh, finally, we explore three different things today. Transfer learning for cancer mortality assessment, reinforced, uh, reinforcement learning for weekly su supervised dental imaging, and fabrication learning that could point us to uh, medical imaging in constrained data settings. So thank you all for participating today. The slides are available at the uh, following URL and you, also you can also contact me if you uh, have further questions.